Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Beginning in verses 1 and 2. Well, I'm actually trying to get through more shape, but we'll see what happens. In, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, the first 11 chapters, Paul was intensely doctrinal. In the beginning of chapter 12, Paul becomes intensely practical. <laughs> the word brethren that he will identify here as we read the end of verse 1 identifies to whom Paul is speaking. He's addressing the Christians, whether they're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. For we all have specific responsibilities if we are in Christ. Dr. H.C. Childs, one of my professors, said of this chapter in these verses, is inasmuch as God has distributed gifts and graces to different individuals in different measure, it is certainly a mark of humility and wisdom for all to evaluate themselves correctly and accurately, avoiding both overestimation and underestimation. So whatever one's gifts may be, it is his responsibility to live in accord with God's will for his glory and for the benefit of others, regardless of what anyone else does. No two Christians are exactly alike in the area of gifts, but there is not one single believer that does not have a gift. All of us have something we can do for the Lord Jesus Christ. So beginning with verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, <clears throat> but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul begins with, I beseech you. I, meaning in the strongest possible sense, I implore you, I plead with you, I urge you by the mercies of God. Now, first of all, what's mercies? Mercies are those things which God has given us through Christ, which Paul expounded upon in the first 11 chapters. Grace, righteousness, and the gift of faith. All those things Paul has expounded upon and saying, now take all of what I've told you up to this point, and by, by the mercy that God has given you, Paul wants us to do something with that. In the first eight verses here of chapter 12, there are seven gifts that are mentioned. Prophesying or preaching, ministry or serving, teaching, which is interpreting revealed truth, Exhorting, appealing to the will, giving, sharing with others, ruling or supervising, showing mercy, caring for the sick, the needy, and the bereaved. Paul is urging us with these gifts, those of us who have these gifts, and all of us have something. All of us have these gifts. Paul is urging us with these gifts God has supplied to present ourselves as living sacrifices. God's not going to prepare you or tell you to do something He's not going to prepare you to do. God's not an ignorant employer. He's not one who just, he's not, he's not an ignorant taskmaster. If He puts you in a situation, He's going to provide you the necessary tools to get it done. So, well, I'm not this and I'm not that. Well, even if you're not, God still gives you the book to help you to understand what you need to do and then go do it. He doesn't leave you comfortless. He doesn't leave you uh, um, uh, instructionless. He provides for you. And Paul is saying, listen, with all these before us, God wants us to present ourselves as living sacrifices. God does not want a dead sacrifice, as in the Old Testament. Jesus provided for that. Jesus already accomplished that when he died on the cross. When we accept him as Savior, we died with him on the cross and rose with him unto new life, and now he wants the sacrifice of our living to be yielded to him and to him alone. Hmm. Presenting our bodies, our lives, means to yield to or to surrender. Now, we sing that song, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender. And that's the way our life should be every morning when you get up, no matter what your day might bring, no matter what your job says you have to do, the first thing out of your mouth in the morning is to thank Him for the new day and say, Lord, from this moment until I go to bed tonight, I surrender it all to mm. You. Before I take a step out that door to go to my job that You provided, 
I surrender my life to you. I surrender all. When yielding or surrendering, it's not specific necessarily. It's whatever God wants. When we're yielding, we're, we're giving everything to Him. Confession of sin, forgiveness of sin is only the beginning. Yielding or surrendering is dedication which leads to separation from the world. And if there's ever a time the Christian church needs to be separated from the world, it's now. Man. If we're not different, why should they come to us? Why would anybody want to come and do the same thing when they can get it better out in the world? We, we Christians try to create things, uh, uh, stage presence and all that that the world does to draw people. But if it's not different than what the world offers, the world does it better. Let them go do it. We should have something different that draws something different. Something very simplistic. We make salvation so complicated and we make worshiping the Lord such a, such a grandiose thing. Well, listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't give our best and do our best. And if you have a you know, great auditorium and all that, good sound system, all that's great. But those are just tools, folks. They should see the difference in us. When we get up to sing, they should see Jesus, not Jim. Amen. Jesus, not Mark. They should see Jesus, not Michelle playing the piano. They can appreciate her talent, but it's pointing to Him. Amen. And if it's not, let's stop it. Yes. Let's just give up now and going over to John and Robbins and have dinner and play pool and shoot and gamble or something. Yeah. You know, who said beer? <laughs> <laughs> Ah. <laughs> Bless you, Bill. <laughs> Thank God we can laugh at those things. Yes. But you know what? There's a lot of places going that. Right. That's right. People leaving the auditorium churches going to having beers and sitting down and drinking whiskey. Yes. Saying it's for the glory of God. That's a nonsense right out of the pit. Yes. So that's where that's from. Right. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't care. I don't have to, I don't have to convince you. All I can do is preach the Word. The Holy Spirit goes and convince it. That's His job. Let me tell you something. You can ignore Him, but you can't get rid of Him. And the power of His, of his conviction goes deeper than your sin. Mm. That's why the great battle rages. Because you're trying to fight out good that's trying to replace that nastiness that's in you. And you just keep belching it back up. Forgive my illustration. That's what it is. That's how nasty it is. You remember when Jonah was in the whale? He was in there because he 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 disobeyed God. What's the, what's the scripture tell us? And the King James has it as right as any. He was vomited back upon the sea. And when you get involved in sin, when when you come out of it, it's like vomit. Because mm. that's how nasty it is. Right? Right. That's right. You need to hear some amen in that. <laughs> Preach. This is, this is right. This is good. Yielding and surrendering is dedication which leads to separation from the world. The world is opposite of God. You cannot revel in the world's lust and in the world's desires and do the will of God. You just can't do it. A lot of people walk around and they wear nice robes and, and crosses and all these things. And there's many denominations do that, but yet they, they do, do the same things the world do uh, does. They walk in the same pattern the world does, but they have they look like the angels of light and it's deception yeah. on a grand scale. God will deal with that. We can expose that if we know about it, but God will deal with that. We need to keep ourselves right. And if the world kills us, we stand before a holy God who's going to clap his hands and say, well done, that I'm good and faithful servant. And that's the way we ought to look at it. You cannot be fashioned like the world and be surrendered to God. Mm. You can't. Because then you're not surrendered. Yielding or surrendering is transformational. He says, by the renewing of your mind, right here in verse 2. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ephesians 4.23. Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So it's a battle for the mind. The heart, yes. But it's a constant battle for the mind. And even as a child of God, if you're not in, in, enraptured with the Word of God, and you're enraptured with everybody else, what everybody else thinks about it, get back to the Word. The Holy Spirit, James said, can give you liberally what the wisdom and understanding you need if you just simply ask for it. And then study the Word that God's provided. That's part of being separated. You're not separated unto God if you're reading everybody else's opinion. 
I'm not saying those things are wrong, but you've got to put it in the right measure and, and keep it in the right context. All those other books are commentaries. This is the book. Amen. There it is. This is about what we leave, uh, live and understand and have our being. This is, this is our, our policy, our doctrinal stance. Everything should come from the pages of the Word of God. If not, then get rid of it. Man. Somebody may be able to help you explain it better. Put back, but uh, if it doesn't come from here, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Why do you think Mormonism and others have the Bible, but yet uh, they have all these other books on top? Because they want their own doctrine. We don't need anybody else's doctrine. We need to follow the doctrine God has put Amen. Because then we're not going to get all messed up. And we get messed up anyway because we're just simply still in the flesh. That's what Paul said. So we really get messed up when we try putting other doctrines on top of what God's already established. He revealed truth of the Word. When we have surrendered our lives, when we have renewed our minds, then what happens? We begin to think like Christ. The Bible says you can do that. Let this mind, let this characteristic be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. Let this obedience be in you. Because he had the mind of obedience. His mind was right, so his heart was right. You get it right in your mind. You get it right when you're teaching, when you're studying. It gets to trickle down in your heart and start doing the right things in your heart. You say, well, I just followed my heart. Let me tell you something. Following your heart's okay on some things, but you better have some wisdom. Because you might follow your heart right into a bad marriage or a bad situation. Well, I just, I just can't help how I feel. Yeah, you know what? You really can. The Scripture says you can. Because it's a choice. You know why so many people are not happy? Especially in the church, I'm talking about church, because they choose not to be happy. Happiness is a choice. Right. Read the scripture. Yes. It's a choice. You can choose. You can choose to be happy in Christ, or you can sit and lament all day long about what you don't have instead of praising God for the salvation you do have. Mm. Yes. Yes. So yeah, but I I mean you so many people go out and they get to go eat steak and filet mignon and all this stuff that's under glass. Well, I don't want anything to under glass. Well, you can eat it. That's fine. I just didn't have a hamburger from Hardy. You know, pheasant under glass. But you get what I'm saying? And then we lament over that instead of saying, oh God, you know, Elijah found himself in a situation uh, out there at the Brook Kareth and he was hungry. And God sent a raven and fed him. Would you take something from a bird? I guess he was hungry enough. But you know what? You thank God for it. How else was he going to get fed? There was nothing out there to feed him with. God sent a bird out there. Well, that's unsanitary, not when God does it. Mm. That's right. That's right. Don't you say anything God does is unclean. That's right. Now, what he said? Yep. Hey, Joel Peter, what I do is not unclean. When God touches it, it's clean. I don't care if, it's, I don't care if an elephant brings it to you in his trunk and throws it at you. It's clean. God bought it. I trust it for you. We should. Yeah. So that's silly. Yeah, the world is silly. Sinfulness is silly. Mankind is silly. That's why God does these things to show you. I, I can overcome anything in the world fires at you. You might be out there in the desert of your own and you get your own little brook carrot out there just, well, oh, they're all after me. Oh, they're old Jezebel's coming and all that. Oh, well, man. Remember what he told one? What he told I one time? He said, I got 7,000 in there without me to bail. Give me the loan. I got people everywhere. Besides that, there's me. Mm. <laughs> one plus God's majority. How in the world do we get away from that stuff? I don't understand that. When we have the mind of Christ, when Christ takes over our thinking, we allow the characteristics of obedience and love and surrender to take over our lives. How do we how do we begin to do that? Now, how do I'm asking you, how do we begin to really I don't understand how to really begin to just surrender everything? How how do I do that? <laughs> well that might seem a little complicated, but the Bible says it's not. <clears throat> Psalm 119 by word. Have I hid my heart? Why? That I may not sin against thee. Start with the word. Get in the word. And then when something comes along, you say, wait a minute, the Bible says I... I mean, some, there are some things that are black and white, and some things that aren't. Some things are really gray. But I'm not sure if I should do that or not. I've always held to this philosophy. And I've said it a thousand times. When in doubt, leave it out. If you're not sure about something, walk away. It may be fine. And you, later on, you might find, well, that, 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 that would have been okay. But sometimes you got to learn. That's part of the process of growth. 
spiritual insight and wisdom. But if you're not sure about something, it's better to let it go. Yeah, but then I miss the blessing. I miss the dinner. I miss, well, if you're not sure about a situation you should be in, give it back to the Lord. Say, I'm not going to do that. And if you were wrong, you can apologize to somebody and then you're wrong. But you would be better off having to go do it again than do it once and be wrong and have to face whatever consequences would come. Sometimes we just got to, when you're not sure, that's the Holy Spirit letting you know, wait a minute. Let's be sure about this. It's not going to kill you. Your salvation is not going to be taken away. But you're gonna, you, you might be walking down a path that you're going to have to take a while to get back from. Stop and think about it. Think it through. Pray about it. If you're not sure, let it go. Let it go. One, one thing is always for sure. Christ is with you. And trust Him. No matter what else. Let it go. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God. Prayer and supplication. And the peace of God. Listen. You want the peace of God? Make your request known with prayer and supplication. Humble yourself. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. You want to be kept? Get in the Lord. Pray about it. Ask God's guidance. James said uh, in one five, I think it is, if you're lacking wisdom, ask God to get some liberal. He's given us all these avenues. Why don't we walk down? Why do we sit over here in the stool and do nothing and think, if I only did that, or if I had only done that, or where we think, gosh, I wonder what I should do now. What would Jesus do? WWJ, you know, and all the people wearing their seats, well, that, that's all fine, but I got news for you. He's told us what Jesus would do. Right. Why don't you find out? Don't sit there like they did up on Mars Hill and pondering all the great things of life. And Paul came by and said, what y'all doing? We're pondering great things of life. And all the great gods and of all are all up there. The spider. All up there. <laughs> and everyone, this this guy was so and so, and this guy, and we're pondering what he said. But well, Paul said, well, there's one here you got to an unknown God. He's saying more than all these others. Him I know. You don't know him. I know him. Mm. I can give you his name. He's called God Almighty. He's called Jesus. He's the eternal creator of the universe. And he has something to say that these other philosophers and gods can't even begin. They can tell you how the code of Hammurabi and all that was all wonderful. The devil just used that as a resource from what Jesus already said in Ten Commandments. But Paul's saying, listen, you talk about all these guys, but what do you get when you're done? You get a lot of philosophy from the world and things, how we ought to walk, and some of them may even be true for but let me tell you what this one said. He said, you're all sinners. And you're all damned from eternal damnation. He said, but I've come to provide a way of escape. My name is God and my son is Jesus. And whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. <laughs> what does your God say? Has he said anything like that? Have they provided anything? No, we throw children to Moloch over here so he'll be appeased. God didn't want to destroy anybody to be appeased. He destroyed himself to appease your sin. Amen. Amen. What about you got me, sir? <laughs> like last week. All the depth of the love of God. All the depth. When we yield our minds and begin to think as Christ thinks, we truly become what? A living sacrifice. Are we truly living sacrifice? Now, folks, I don't think you have to live in poverty to be a living sacrifice. But you know what? If that's what it took, would you be willing to do it? I don't think God's going to do this, but He, for whatever reason, He might. What if He come down in your prayer time and you're, you're, you're seeking His will time and all that, and He says, Jim, I want you to get rid of everything. I want you to sell everything. I want you to give it to the church. And I want you to just trust me. I wonder how far we go. That's hard, isn't it? That's hard. Jim, I'm going to make you ride the Sue every day for a few months. <laughs> See, Sue's name in Hebrew is Jehu. <laughs> for she drives seriously her chariot. <laughs> have, have I kind of got it there? <laughs> but you know what? If, if that was true, and I'm not saying by any sense of words, thank God he's still with me. But what happens if I give everything away? Then you have to trust me. 
Is that wise? It's not in the world's eyes. And maybe you wouldn't, you'd have to make sure God's talking to you. I understand that. But how far would we, is our faith so in tune that we would be willing to do anything that God said and not question? I mean, I don't think, I mean, I don't, the Bible tells us to pray and, and even to seek counsel from the horny heads, the white hairs, the elders. There's nothing wrong with that. But when God, when it really, when you're so troubled and you know the direction you need to walk in, how far will we go to trust Him? Would you give everything you've got aside? Would you sell everything you've got? Say, Lord, I don't think I've got my shoes on. What do you think Israel had when they came through the desert? Well, they had each other. Yeah, but they had no food. They had their clothes never dried up, uh, never went bad, their shoes never went bad. He provided manna from heaven. Well, yeah, but that gets old. May, maybe so, but he's provided your need. God never provided, God never said he would do anything else. He's going to provide your need here. Why? Because you're just like Israel was in the desert. You're a pilgrim and a stranger. You haven't gotten to your holy place yet. You haven't gotten to the promised land yet. So how far would we go? See, we want to settle down. Every time they wanted to settle down, God said, wait a minute, this is not yours yet. You can't settle here. Why do you think he made them pack up all them tents and walk a few hundred miles or a, a few miles and then set up? Because it kept them busy. And they couldn't get settled in the desert. I don't want to be in the desert of God's mm. grace. Do you? I want to be in the land that's flourishing with milk and honey. And I'm going there someday. I'm not there yet. He's blessed us here, but I'm going there. Yes. I can just see it. I can, I can almost be like Israel. I can just see over the site there. I'm, 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 I'm about to see old Jordan. We're, we're nearing that place. But this is not my home. My home is over there. And that's why our minds have to be. That's why we've got to give everything up. And then not only being a living sacrifice, folks, it's holy and acceptable. You understand what he's saying? You're holy. Your life is holy. Because you're in Christ. Do we act holy? No. Now all of us, sometimes I think we do. We have little bits of holiness once in a while. We, we, most of us just parents. You all right? You need a drink? I got one. Any ain't frozen. You got one? Oh, you need this. You don't want that nasty stuff. Go to the good stuff. See, it's amazing. It's amazing when you drink, drink a cup of coffee there, that nasty old dirty stuff, there, and there's nice clean water. Isn't that what the world does with Jesus? You, you try to drink the dirty stuff to get it right when he's providing clear water in the water. That's a good illustration. The Lord made you cough right time out of here. <laughs> You've been sick. I ain't touching that thing. <laughs> Phew. Not only, listen, listen to me. This is good. You write this down. Yeah. Not only is the presentation or yielding of our bodies a living sacrifice, it is holy and acceptable. Someone said it like this, and this is one of the best explanations I've ever heard. In a galaxy of undeserved mercies, which God provides for us pardon from the past, peace in the present, and power in the future, and by what Christ has done for us, is doing in us and desires to do through us, we should be highly motivated to present our bodies, our lives to Him as instruments for use wherever He wants to send us. Wherever He wants to send us. Are you motivated because you're a Baptist? Or because you're, your mom and dad and grandmom didn't know? We should be motivated to live for Him, not out of obligation. Even though we are obligated, I think. But we should be motivated to live for him before, because you were dying and you went to hell. Eternal damnation. And we can look at Romans 8, 1 and say that because I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, there is therefore now, now no condemnation Amen. to them who are in Christ Jesus. Right now, now when you get to heaven, you're as if you're already there. We just have to finish. Israel's, Israelites were Israelites before they got to the promised land. They will always be God's children. Finally, they got into the promise, and there was a lot of a lot of things God had to do, a lot of sin, a lot of people didn't make it, but they got there. And you're no longer condemned, even though you're not past through the, the portal of glory yet to get in there. You're you're for sure of that, as if you're already there. 
and you should be happy. So it's holy. Our, our sacrifice is holy and acceptable to God. Then he says sacrifice. What does sacrifice mean? It means voluntary offering. By doing what? By quitting my job and going, no, if God told you to, that's fine. But whatever, I often think when I think about these things, how the shepherds, when they came, they left their flock, came to see Jesus that wonderful morning, or by night, they saw the Savior, but yet they went back and watched their flock. They didn't change their, their job situation, but I guarantee you they changed how they approached it. And so were you. So were you. It means a voluntary offering. What, what's the voluntary offering? No matter what you do, whatever your job is, your, your, the voluntary offering of sacrifice means that no matter what you're doing during the day, but every beat of your heart, every breath of your lungs belong to Christ. Everything you do is for His glory. And so doing, listen to me, listen. When we give everything to Christ, no matter what your job is in life, no matter what your situation is, if we give everything to Christ, He walks with our feet. He sees with our eyes. He speaks with our tongue. He works with our hands. When we give it all to Him, no matter where you might find yourself, whether you're a brain surgeon or you sweep floors, you do it with Christ and Him alone. He sees through your eyes. He walks with your feet. The message is carried uh, with your feet. It's, 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 it's displayed with your mouth. It's spoken by your tongue when you've given everything to Him. You become an additional instrument with which Christ can touch lives around you for what Christ has done for us. Listen, that's why he said when you do that <clears throat> and you do it because of what Christ did for you, it's reasonable. It's a reasonable service. Amen. It makes sense. Don't you think it makes sense Amen. to do that for what Christ has done for you? That's why I said, and for which is your reasonable servant. It, it wasn't like, you know. He could have really made a big deal about this. He said, wait a minute, folks, I'm just trying to tell you something. Jesus came and died for you. you. You were a sinner going to hell. You're redeemed on your way to heaven. Don't you think it's reasonable you want to live for him? Hmm. Somebody walks up and gives you a ton of money. Don't you think it's reasonable you for you to thank him? Thanks. Yeah. Man, I can get out of a lot of debt now. Let me tell you something. When he died on the cross and rose again and saved my miserable soul, talk about getting out of debt. Amen. He took care of a debt that I could never take care of. No bank in the world could have given me enough to take care of it. Jesus took care of it. We ought to say, thank you, Lord. And when I'm driving my truck or when I'm working or when I'm doing the egg, whatever I'm doing is for the glory of God. You haven't given a thought that you, no matter what you're... And, and please take this away. It's meant whether your job's meaning you or not. If Christ did it, nothing's meaning you. Right. For every step you take, it's safe way. That's a good term. When Jesus, it's a safe way. <laughs> yeah. When you go to wise, Jesus is wise. Okay. Here we go. You, you, you can't get away from it. No matter where you work. No matter what you do. Law enforcement, he's the great protector. Firefighters, he's the great firefighter. Hell. <laughs> he's the greatest insurance agent that the world's ever seen. Because I'm as sure for going to heaven as if I'm learning. And he always pays, he always paid off on my debt. Isn't that wonderful? I'm not sitting there looking at me like a mule looking at a new being. It's reasonable for us, for us to do this. And then, uh-oh, here, here we go now. Now I'm not going to even get to near the rest of these. That's all right. Verse 2. We'll find out in verse 2. Be not conformed. Uh-oh, here we go. To this world. But be transformed by the new year. I already talked about the mind side, but now we're going to go back and talk about the being conformed part. Listen. After we have presented our bodies, our lives to the Lord, we have to still live here. We understand that. We have to live in a world that's against the holiness of Christ. That's against Christ 
Period. We have to live here. But conformity, listen, is not an option for the Christian. The call is for non-conformity. Does that mean civic on the rest line? No. Only when it directly involves your a command from the Lord to, to preach the gospel and to represent the gospel. To live for him in, in moral, moral holiness. The world is evil. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, It is led by the God of this world, was the course of Satan. But God demands, listen to me, God demands <coughs> believers to refuse to be a part of this foolish, selfish, uh, selfish age which leads to destruction. He wants us to comply with His will. Why? Because it's good. And it's perfect. God's will is not, listen, God's will for your life is not to be endured. It's not so, oh no, I, I, I just, I just got to live for the world. Sometimes it's harder to live for God than just to live for the world. No, it's just because you're, you're swimming upstream sometimes with the world. Because it's opposite of God. But God's will for your life is not to be endured, folks. It's to be cherished. We should get on our face and say, thank you, God, that you're providing a way for me to have clarity of mind, clarity of heart in the middle of this ungodly, un now, this nasty mess we call a world today is far deeper, folks, than we allow ourselves to think of it. It's nasty and mean. And even here in America, we're starting to see what the rest of the world has known for the last 2,000 years. How mean and nasty people can be when it comes to the gospel and Christian uh, living. Now we're the hate mongers. Now we're the ones who, who spread the word of God and spread the peace and love of God and spread that God forgives and corrects. Now we're the ones who are nasty and mean mm. and hate mongers because we won't give in on some topics that the world says is okay. God warned us that men will say good is evil and evil is good. And he said, beware of those times. I got news for you. We're in them times. Yes. Government, our own government has stood up and said that what God has declared is sinful and mean, we have declared that it's okay. God had declared that homosexuality was blasphemous and a despicable act. And we get up and say, it's okay. I've got news for you. The judgment hasn't come yet. That's going to fall. Because not only are you telling people what God has said is okay, God said it's okay that He's already said it was wrong, you're, you're directing people's minds and hearts away from the truth. Mm. And it'll be harder to win them now to Christ. Because our witness is being declared by our own government that we are wrong. And that now they're wanting, like they do in Canada, some provinces up there have declared that anything in Scripture that has anything to do with homosexuality, lesbianism, or transgender has to be changed in the scripture. Or it's a federal offense. Their, their level of federal uh, compared to ours. I'm telling you something. It's coming here. So are we going to be willing, through love and compassion, folks, are we going to be willing to sacrifice? Is our bodies a living sacrifice? Verse 3, Paul says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly according, to, according as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. Paul is saying, listen, he can speak to us because of God's grace. I can tell you these things because of God's grace. I, I, I tell you because I love you, but it's because of the grace of God you need to hear this. He, need, he wants you to live for him. Paul is speaking, listen, Paul is speaking uh, a humble Paul for what God had done and it should humble us. But Paul is speaking to those who consider themselves superior because they have been saved. And there are some that I'm kind of walk around with. I got it, man. 
I'm redeemed, and I can ask God anything, and He's obligated to give it. That is nowhere found in Scripture. He said, you have not because you ask not. If you, if you seek right, you might get something. Most of the time, we ask amiss. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something. There's never a time we go to God with a check broken out check saying, Father, I'm your son and I demand this. Uh, he's going to point you back to the cross. And if you, if you have any spirituality at all about you, you're going to be on your face before an eternal God who loved you enough to die on the cross. I'm not saying we have to walk around with shaved heads and all that. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you this. The greatest power is going to come from the most humble. Because God will bless the humble. And he gives a little pattern to the, to the arrogant and proud. As he should. Paul reminded us in Galatians. Listen to me this morning. And I'll be closing in here. Galatians 2.20. I, listen, my life now, I'm redeemed and I know it. But there's only one reason why. Because I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You can't declare anything. You can thank God you're saved, but let me tell you something. Whatever you do, however you walk, the blessing or whatever you have to face, you, you can only declare that I live and I do because Christ lives in me. Amen. And the life I live is because of him. Mm. And him alone. Damn, you know what we're going through. I don't care what you're going through. I'm, I'm sad if you're going through things. But you know what? There's nothing you could go through in this life that could ever compare to what Jesus did. Right? right. When are we going to humble ourselves? <laughs> I, I wonder, and of course, we've never had any real catastrophe as far as our house being flooded or knocking down. I mean, some people seem like back in New Orleans. Some people built up after Katrina, and now they're ruined again, you know. And people just keep rebuilding. I mean, they go through some horrible things. Uh, a tornado comes through and knocks your house down, and you wonder, oh my God. <coughs> well, the things that are lost, they're lost. I'm sorry. Pictures can be, yeah, I don't know, mementos, it hurts. But let me tell you something. God's got, got all that somewhere. If, if you really need it, He can give it back to you. But that's not the point. The point is, in the destruction, no matter what you have gone through here, can you imagine what Job went through? Uh -huh. He lost his kids. He lost his home. He lost his cattle, his business. Everything was taken from him. And then he had to sit in sackcloth and ashes and boil so that he had to scrape them off with pottery. You done that lately? Would you still have the consciousness and faith in God to look to him and say, you can kill me, Lord? If you want, I'm still going to trust you. Wow. People can look and say, boy, look at them Baptists. Boy, how much faith. I want to see, look at them Baptists. I want to say, look at those people who trust Christ and, Christ yes. and him alone. How can we be Baptists? The folks, I don't want that. I don't, I don't want people, man, he's just a good Baptist. No, there's, there's a lot of good Baptists that don't, that don't walk with Christ. They're nice, hearty people. But I want somebody to look and say, that man walked with the spirit of Jesus Christ. Hmm. He walked, Christ walked in him. Don't you want that? Is your life a living sacrifice? Holy and acceptable to God? Which is reasonable? <laughs> Which is reasonable? We have been crucified with Christ and now he lives through us. We should not think of ourselves more highly for what he has done. In my opinion, we who have been born again should be the most humble people on the face of the planet. That first of all, the Holy Spirit loved us enough to, that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead, and the Holy Spirit loved us enough to convict us of our sins. 
and that Christ, when we call upon him, will save us. We ought to humble ourselves, don't you think? And I think that ought to start today. Father in heaven, I humble myself before you. I know my failure. I know where I have sinned and failed you, even as a child, and I ask for forgiveness. And I, I pray, God, that my life would represent not just my education and all those things, which is okay. But when they look at me, may they see Jesus. And in Him alone. I pray that for everybody in this place. I pray that for whoever might be listening, that especially if they're lost and not Having come to know Christ, I pray that that Lord, above anything else, convict our save the lost Lord. Meet every evil, everybody in this building. As we leave this place to go fellowship again this afternoon, may we go with a renewed sense of understanding of Jesus Christ. I, I live my being because of who He is and what He is in me. The life that I now live. In this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Help that to be our motto every day. I'm doing my work. I'm, I'm walking my walk. I'm doing whatever I need to do on a daily basis because of him who loved me and gave himself for me. May Christ be magnified in all that we do. I pray in Jesus.